Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The former account here is referring to none other than the Gospel of Luke. The author of the book of Acts is Dr. Luke. We don't know much about Dr. Luke, except that he is a doctor. This we know. We also know that he was a companion of the Apostle Paul, and among others. We know also that he was a Gentile, and he, that's why he hung out with Paul. We don't know how far back into the gospel story he goes, meaning when did he actually come into the faith? When did he come in contact with the early church? Was Jesus still alive at that time? We, we don't really know a lot about Luke, We know that he was an expert writer. We we know this a lot because of what he said in his opening letter to Theophilus in Luke chapter 1. He said, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Right away in that first sentence, you realize this is not your normal writer. This is not a fisherman writing this down. (laughs) This This is a little more than fisherman writing. This is... Uh, someone who's educated, and the way he writes it, you, you kind of get that feel. And he's, he goes on and he says, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So he's saying this is a real good uh, record of the story, of the facts. And so I want you to know them, O Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? We don't know that either. He does have a Greek name, Theophilus. Two words put together, Theos and Phileos. Theos, Phileos. Pretty cool, right? Lover of God, that's what his name means. So some have thought perhaps he's writing to those who love God. And in that case, it could be to any part of the church, any number of of the churches that would have existed in his day, uh, or anyone who loves the Lord. Perhaps Theophilus was one of those, uh, you know, um, uh, secret names, you know, uh, a code name for the Christian people. And that's possible, and if we look at it that way, certainly it is a book that we want to know about, we accept it, we receive it. It is also possible that Theophilus was perhaps a Greek official or a Roman official, at that time it was Greco-Roman, so it's probable that this was an official within, of, with high rank within some government place, and so he's giving him the information about this movement that would become known as Christianity. Later on in the book of Acts, it's called the way, the way. And so the way didn't have a name yet, but we find out where they were first called Christians in this book of Acts. And so we'll get to that. We'll point it out when we get there. But here this letter is written to this fellow named Theophilus, probably a fellow. I doubt that it was a code word, but it's probably a fellow that he was writing to since we have the Gospel of Luke as well. And notice it says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. I know I wrote the gospel, and that wasn't the end, and so here we're going to continue on. In fact, there was a time before uh, the uh, Bible was assembled together that the books of Luke and Acts were actually stuck together. They were like two volumes set. And uh, you might try reading these two books like that. Read the book of the Gospel of Luke and then skip over John and go right to Acts and read them together. But I'd like you to think about something. What if there was no book of Acts? What if there wasn't anything like the book of Acts to, to show us what happened after Jesus went up into heaven? What happened? This is what the book of Acts tells us. I mean, if you think about it, you would skip right over the book of Acts and you go right into Romans written by this guy named Paul. You'd be scratching your head going, who's Paul? Who is this guy? So you kind of have to have this book to fill in the history that is between the Gospels and the, and the Epistles, and that's what this book is doing. It's giving us the perfect history of what happened now that Jesus has left the earth. And 
that's something that we find out, and we love it because at the end of it, we have Paul who's still alive, sitting in a prison, waiting to be, uh, have his audience with Caesar Nero. And so here is a wonderful uh, story that doesn't end. It just keeps going. So the word began is a very good word when you think about how it relates to us today. Because, as many have said, the book of Acts is still being written today through the acts of the Holy Spirit in your life and through, your, through our lives. And so these are the, all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, have, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, immediately we have the introduction of the Holy Spirit we know him as the third person of the Trinity or the third person, the third member of the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is working through people and doing these great works uh, in the book of Acts. Really, it's often called the Acts of the Apostles, when in reality it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, through the saints, through many saints. And as you see, by the time we get to the middle of the book, Already, it's more than just apostles that are being used by the Holy Spirit. You'll be introduced to a lot of people, as, and that's what gives us, of course, the, uh, the freedom to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And so he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive, Jesus did, presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after Jesus rose from the dead, he presented himself to others who would be the witness of his resurrection. Uh, And so they uh, are, I guess you might say, listed in the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you have this whole uh, list of individuals uh, that uh, Paul refers to as ones who saw the risen Christ. Luke calls these things infallible proofs. Proofs. This is the evidence. Now, you could take this evidence into a court of law, and they couldn't possibly throw it out. There are too many witnesses to the account. And so a judge couldn't say it's cuckoo. There's too many for it to be a conspiracy. That's what Luke is saying. That's what Paul is saying. This is the real deal. You have to believe this. And so in verse 1 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, who is Peter, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present day, but some have fallen asleep. What he's saying is, Well over 500 people saw Jesus alive after he should have been dead, meaning they saw the resurrected Christ. So that's a lot of witnesses. And notice what Paul says there in verse 6. He said, after that he, he was seen by over 500 brethren, meaning believers, at once, of whom Most of them are still alive at the writing of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. That's what he's talking about. If you don't believe me, he said, go ask them. They were there. They saw it. They'll they'll vouch for what I'm saying. So he said, though some of them fell asleep, meaning some have died, but the majority of them are still alive. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as one who, who was born out of due time. In other words, I don't know how I got included in all this, but I got to see the resurrected Lord as well. And that we'll see in Acts chapter 9 
when uh, Jesus appears to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. So he tells the story. Luke confirms that there were these proofs. Paul sort of lists them. There's so many other proofs. And the proofs that he's going to be describing in the book of Acts are the works that Jesus was doing through his Spirit and in the lives of the apostles and those who would go out from their teachings as well. So, in other words, you'll see Jesus working through other people. That's how we know he's alive. Jesus is working. He's working in people's lives. He's bringing salvation. He's healing. He's changing people. He's doing that today. That's why we know that he's still alive. And, you know, you can compare it to an atomic bomb. And can you tell me how an atomic bomb works? Well, no, uh, but I can go find out. And I go and I read about the atomic bomb, and I realize that the atomic bomb actually does work. And we happen to have videos of it. We've seen it. We've seen the devastation of what it's done in Japan. We know that it works. We've seen it. We believe that it works. And the idea is, is I don't know how it works. I just know the effect of how it works. I've seen it work. And so I believe in atomic bombs because of that. But that's the same thing with Jesus. I don't know how he works. I don't know how he is. I don't know how he died and rose from the dead. I don't know the details of those things. I mentioned the third member of the Trinity. I don't know how the Trinity works. I just know that you cannot ignore it everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't understand it, but I believe it because I can't ignore it. And the same thing, you go to Japan and you'll see, or at least know, the results of what happened after the atomic bomb. You can say it's nothing like it. It doesn't exist. Well, of course it does. You don't have to believe it, but you'd be wrong. Same thing with Jesus. You don't have to believe him, but you'd be wrong. Because everywhere he goes, he touches people. And something changes in their lives. And that's one of the reasons we believe it. These are the infallible proofs. And to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly submerged with water, but you shall be submerged with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's the right way to understand. The word baptism is to be immersed or to be stuck underwater, to be completely overwhelmed with water. That's the idea. The baptism here that he's talking about of John is the one of water. You know how John, he's saying, do you know how John stuck you underwater and the water just covered you all over? That's what I'm going to do to you with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. I'm going to smother you with it. You're going to be completely overflowed, completely overtaken by the power of the Holy Spirit. But don't go anywhere until that happens. Wait in Jerusalem until you have been submerged in the Spirit of God. And then, then things will start popping. And so as John uh, baptized, um, then you're going to experience that same change. Something happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Something happens. And I challenge you with this as we go through the book of Acts. If that something has not happened to you, then you need to talk to God about it. You need to ask him, what is it that I'm not getting? What is it that I'm not experiencing? Am I not seeing it? What is it? But I'm asking, will you give me your Holy Spirit? Jesus said that in Luke chapter 11. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so that's where we begin this study. We get hit it right on, heavy, right there. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, uh, Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. They gathered together there on the Mount of Olives, 
and he was about to go into heaven. Well, as they're all gathering together, he said, look, I want you guys just to wait over there in Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is very close, very close. You, it's, it's just down this little hill, and right up on the rise, there you are. You're at the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. So it's, it's so close. And he says, from the Mount of Olives, you, go over there and wait there, because the Holy Spirit is coming. I have promised him to you, John chapter 14, Holy Spirit's coming. He's the gift that I'm giving to you. It's necessary that I go away so that the Holy Spirit will come into your lives, and that's very important. So go wait. Don't do anything but wait. And I'd suggest to you, actually, that that's a good idea too. Until that something happens, what I mean by something, I'm talking about this, this immersion of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what is the preparation for the work of the ministry. That's what is the sending force, if you will, of the ministry. The, the, the legs of your ministry comes from the power, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, wait there. And, they, and as, they're, as they're hearing this, it's almost rude of them to sort of turn the subject around and say, hey, are you going to set up the kingdom of Israel now? Are you going to do it now? Are you going to take over everything? And you're going to be the, the, the new king over Israel? Because that's what we've been waiting for. And Jesus said in verse 7, it's not for you to know. <laughs> I hate that. It's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. And there are a couple ways that we can look at this. Number one, it's none of your business. And that's something that Jesus may have been telling them. It's really none of your business. It's another way they he could have meant it, is that not in your lifetime. <laughs> it's not going to happen in your lifetime. They wanted it now. But if you notice something, they really had the wrong vision. They had the wrong idea of what Jesus was actually up to. They were thinking, Messiah comes, boom, we have a new kingdom. All of the, the bad guys are pushed out of our government. We are now free to govern ourselves because Jesus is going to be our mighty king. And no more Romans, no more invaders. It's now us and Jesus, and we're Jews again. And they were that narrow focus, that narrow-minded. But as we're going to see, as Jesus continues to instruct them, this is way bigger than Israel, way bigger. And this is only the beginning. So he may have been saying, not in your lifetime, meaning you won't see it. You're going to die before all this happens. And as we see the prophetic cycle or the prophetic um, picture, we understand it now. Israel didn't have its own rule until 1948. That was our, our, many of our generation, not mine, I have to say, but for some of us here, they saw that happen historically. And uh, it, it's, um, it's something that is modern history is what I'm saying. This is not ancient history. Israel did not come into its own until 1948. And so Jesus was saying definitely not in your lifetime or could have been saying. But for sure, another way that he was mentioning this is don't preoccupi preoccupy yourselves with such things. Don't preoccupy yourselves with the idea of when the prophecies are going to be fulfilled and all this. Sometimes we do get a little caught up on prophecy. Not a bad thing. Very interesting. Very exciting. Uh, fun to do. But often we speculate a lot when it comes to prophecy and we get a little off kilter. That's what Jesus is saying here. Don't get yourselves off kilter. It's not for you to know about those times or seasons. It belongs in the hands of my Father. That's His. That's going to come at a future time. But, forget all that stuff. Here's what I want you to focus on. And he, Jesus now returns back to the original subject of the Holy Spirit. You guys, you're off track here. But let me get you back on track. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So you see the pushing out of the gospel. It's going to start here in Jerusalem, but it's not ending here. It's going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This thing is so big, you guys haven't a clue. That's why. Go in Jerusalem, wait there. 
I got to give you the power to do this because you're not going to do it in your own strength. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the word power is that Greek word dunamis, and it talks about a, a mighty power. We get the word dynamite from that, or dynamo, dynamic, all come from that one Greek root word. But here, Jesus is promising them a power that's going to help them or enable them to do all this work and reach beyond their borders, beyond their imagination, by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you or has baptized you, he will come upon you and fill you to overflowing overtake you, overwhelm you, and you will be under his influence. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He's not talking about political influence or power. He's not talking about military influence or power. He's talking about spiritual influence and power. That's big. That's huge. That touches the inside of a person. It has the power to to take away their sins, the power to, to give them eternal life, It has the power to change them for the better. And so this is what Jesus is concerned with. You're going to receive that power. Don't worry about the other things. You have much work to do. And in order to do it, I'm going to give you this power from on high. Now when he had spoken these things, while they were watching, he was taken up and a a cloud received him out of their sight. Now Luke Again, in his gospel, as he ended the gospel of Luke, actually uh, gave a little more detail. In uh, the last chapter, in verse 50, it says, And he led them out as far as Bethany. So they came up to the Mount of Olives. Bethany is just over the ridge of the Mount of Olives, still right on top of that mountain ridge. Bethany is actually part of the Mount of Olives. And so he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So here's, here's the scene. He's taken from them, departed as he was blessing them. He put out his hands. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon thee and give thee rest. Woof, up he goes. The cloud consumes him or takes him up. Many believe that could be that Shekinah glory cloud that led the children of Israel around in the wilderness. You remember when we were in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is now taken out from their sight. And as he's taken up from their sight, in verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two men predominantly presumed to be angels, though some have suggested Elijah and Moses. Probably angels, though. We have no reason to think that they were Elijah and Moses. We don't know who they were. It just says two men. Fun to speculate. Just don't dig your heels in. Best way to put it. Speculate if you wish. Don't dig in, because there's no way we can know. And so two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee... Why do you stand gazing up into uh, heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So, you know, uh, what are you guys doing standing here? Uh, He told you to go to Jerusalem, so go to Jerusalem. You know, why are you gawking? Uh, But know this, and it's, it's, you know, this is perhaps why some people think that these guys are prophets, because this, in a sense, was a bit of a prophecy. Uh, as you um, think of the, the verse in Zechariah chapter 14, listen to this fascinating verse. When you compare it to what the two men, the angels or the two prophets, were saying, Jesus, in particular in verse 11, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's going to take the same path, in other words. You saw him go up from Mount of Olives, he's going to come down to the Mount of Olives. Watch what it says here in Zechariah chapter 14. Listen to this. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. 
The city shall be taken. The houses shall be plundered. The women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So there's, this is going to be a, a bunch of people are going to be out. The other half of the people or so are going to be under threat within the city. Then it says in verse 3 of Zechariah 14, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against all those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, as if to say, hello, I'm home. And everyone's going to get pushed out of the way. In fact, it says, making a very large valley, half of the mountain shall move toward the north and the other half toward the south, and that will create this humongous valley that's uh, a, ultimately water is going to flow through it. A miraculous thing is going to happen. But this is a, talk, uh, a, a prophecy regarding the last days. And here, these two men make reference to that. Just as you saw him go up, He's coming back the same way. And when he comes, the earth's going to move. Things are going to happen. And that ultimately, the way we understand it, is the end of time, the end of the government of man upon the earth. Jesus now sets up shop. There's going to be a bit of a battle, but it's just a small little thing. How do you defeat Jesus? Oh, I wanted to read one more thing to you before we go, because this is really the cool part. You wonder, well, where are we? In verse 5 of Zechariah 14, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. You say, Azal, I don't know where that is. Trust me, Christians, you don't need to know where it is because you're not going to be there. This is only for Jerusalem people. This is for Jewish people. It's not for Christian people at all. He's going to cause his people to be rescued, the Jewish people. As we've said all along as we were going through the Old Testament, God has a wonderful plan for the nation of Israel. Not spiritualized Israel, meaning the Christian church. That's a whole different belief we don't buy into completely. But this is talking about the Israelites, the people who belong to the nation, the current nation of Israel. From the mountain valley to, uh, they will reach Azal, yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake, uh, speaking in Amos, about the one that happened in Amos, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus, notice this, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That's you and me. This is a, this is a, a promise of the second coming and where we will be first thessalonians 4 talks about this that we're going to be with the lord we will always be with the lord and when he returns the mount of, Ol mount of olives we're going to be there with him we're going to be right on top of that mountain we're going to come in through those gates and everything's going to become a whole different thing so this is i bet you were reading acts you didn't know there's old testament prophecy that's being supported right here in the in the uh, new testament so write that down in your margin there, Zechariah 14, and go do some real good research there. In verse 12 of Acts chapter 1, Then they returned to Jerusalem, obedient guys, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. A Sabbath day's journey means... The Sabbath day journey is a, um, a rabbinical law. Now, we know that the Old Testament Exodus tells the Jewish people that they were to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And the, the instruction in Exodus was, guys, just stay home. Don't, don't go to work that day. Stay home and enjoy your family. Enjoy your rest. It's a day of rest. Well, the rabbis wanted to explain that, so through their interpretations, they came up with the rabbinical law. You're not allowed to travel 2,000 cubits uh, beyond the city wall. And where that came from, we're not exactly sure. But it is their rule. It is their law. And that's why when you go to Israel today, you find the elevators that on Saturdays, they stop at every floor, lest anyone should inadvertently press a button and create it to go up two floors instead of one. Don't ask. Anyway, that is the way they interpret this. We call it rabbinical law which means it's not Bible law, 
its Jewish tradition. And that was written down in their book called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is their interpretation of God's laws uh, so that you will know how to perform them properly. So just to be safe, they say, don't travel. Uh, 2,000 cubits, by the way, is less than half a mile. So the idea of this verse is that the Mount of Olives was within a half a mile of the Temple Mount. And that's what we know from the Mount of Olives. And you could see the pictures of that. It's, it's right there. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John. And the upper room was probably either in the portico around the Temple Mount, right there on the Temple Mount. You know, today you see the dome, the Golden Dome. That's the Temple Mount. Uh, right across the river, or there's a little dry river now, but right across that is the Mount of Olives. And we have stood on the Mount of Olives and looked straight across that little ravine, and there is the Mount of Olives, the, I'm sorry, the Temple Mount, where the dome is. Where that dome is used to be the temple of God, the Jewish temple. In the 400s, 500s, whenever it was invaded by the, the, the Turks and ultimately taken over by Muslim rule, uh, Muhammad, they began to incorporate, all, take all of these holy sites and make them, declare them holy for Islam. And that's how the Temple Mount was put there. Uh, the Dome of the Rock, I'm sorry, was put there. It's not even the Dome of the Rock that's the holy place. It's the little uh, mosque that's right near the Al-Aqsa Mosque is right there on the end. That's the holy place of that mountain there where they believe uh, Muhammad stepped there when he was uh, flying his uh, white-winged horse. I didn't make this up. I'm just telling you. But that's, that's their belief and why they can't just bulldoze that thing over. That can't happen because it's extremely, it's the third holiest site in all of Islam. So it's a real tough, tough place. And it is the only holy site for Jewish people. And um, it's much less holy for Christian people. So it's, uh, we just go there to enjoy the site and, and falafels. The... Uh, Upper room contained Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. That's 11 if you want to count them. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they were all there. Interesting crowd, wouldn't you say? The 11 apostles, of course, not 12, because Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. And they were all together in this upper room. They were in one accord. And that's not a Honda, by the way. That's a, uh, can you, how, many, how many apostles can you get in the Honda? No. Uh, that's, uh, uh, one, it's in unity, but in unity of mind, unity of purpose. They knew they had a job to do. They just came from the mountain. They watched Jesus go up. We've got a job to do. What do we do? Well, he, he said we should wait. All right, let's wait then. While we're waiting, we're going to worship. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Let's, let's pray. And these all continued in one accord in prayer. Prosuke, remember we learned that on Sunday. And supplication, desis. It's also a word we learned on Sunday. These are different prayers, but basically they were waiting on the Lord. And the women were there. Who are these women? Well, of course, there are the multitude of Marys that hung around with Jesus. It's like club. It's the Mary club. You all had to have the name Mary if you wanted to follow Jesus around. You know, anyone who wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and change their name to Mary. No, I'm just kidding, of course. But uh, some think that the women here could refer to the wives of the apostles. What are you going to do with them? I mean, you can't just leave your wife, even though Jesus has called you. And most of these guys were certainly married. They probably were married, and so all of them may have had their wives with them. Of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. She was his number one fan for sure. But here's the odd group, his brothers. His brothers were there. 
Why is that odd? Well, because according to Mark chapter 3 and John chapter 7, his brothers weren't too keen on his ministry. They didn't believe in him. But now they're in the upper room praying. They must have had a visit uh, of him, uh, by him. And so they were there probably, uh, almost certainly, as believers. We believe now they are believers. Later on, James, the Lord's brother, half-brother, would be one of the um, leaders of the Christian church. And Jude, the one who wrote the book of Jude, also a half-brother of Jesus. The one who wrote the book of James also became the leader of the, of the Christian church, James, also then Jude. So uh, we find them all being a part of this new movement that is uh, going to sweep the world. This is what the power of the Holy Spirit was for. Change the world. Go change the world. And that's what was going to happen. But Jesus said, wait for that power to come. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. So in that upper room, must have been quite a room, banquet room perhaps, 120 were assembled and said, Peter said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And so Peter is moved by the scriptures. Um, this, this supernatural inspiration that gave this fisherman, keep in mind he's a fisherman, he's a fisherman, He's not a scholar. He's a fisherman. And suddenly he's gotten this interest for Bible things. You have to believe this. Come on. It's, it's, you, know, you know what it's like to work with construction guys or, or to work with uh, you know, people who work in factories or you know, whatever kind of trade you may want to throw in there, um, politicians, uh, any of them. You know, they, they kind of have their way. Their, their, it's their way. Their way may often be not the most moral way or not the most proper way. There, there's a lot of vulgarity, a lot of bad things. I expect in Jesus' day, it was much the same thing with the blue-collar crowd of the fishing, fishing world. And here, suddenly, Peter stands up and says, I, I have a verse. God has given me a verse. And I think we have to obey this verse. That's, that's what he's seven, or saying. He's saying in verse 16, the scripture had to be fulfilled regarding Judas. The scripture he's referring to, as he mentions it's from David, is the one from Psalm 41 and verse 9, where David, no doubt speaking of his own struggles and trials, but the Holy Spirit inspiring David to write this prophetically, which makes it a messianic verse, a messianic psalm, even my own familiar friend David wrote, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. David wrote that, but it happened, in truth, to Jesus. And so here, Peter puts them together. David said it, but it was certainly talking about Judas and what Judas would do to Jesus. And so he says, that prophecy had to be fulfilled. I'm sorry it had to happen to one of ours, but it had to happen is what he's saying. And the Holy Spirit spoke it. It came from him, and it came from him in more than one way. He spoke it to David, but he also spoke it to Peter who put it together. That's how the Holy Spirit works when we're reading Scripture, studying it, and suddenly, wow, it just hits you. It's the Holy Spirit that brings the enlightenment. That's why you get it. You know, and as you're sitting here, maybe you're hearing some things, you're going, wow, I never saw that before. Yeah, it could be the Holy Spirit speaking through his word, the Holy Spirit speaking through the teacher, and the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart. He's at, at all ends of this. That's where inspiration comes from and why you go, wow, that just blew my mind, man. That's, that's the Holy Spirit that blows your mind, man. Man, am I dating myself, but that... That's how I used to talk back then, man. For, verse 17, he was numbered with us, Peter, giving this testimony of Judas, and obtained a part in this ministry. This was his. He was a part of us. Oh, there's nothing harder than seeing people that you labored with 
served side by side, you sat in their Bible studies, you heard them and said, man, these guys are so good. And then to hear that they've left their wife or they've gone off into sin somewhere and they're no longer serving God, oh, it just breaks your heart. And that's the way Peter's feeling right now. This guy was one of us. He was given a part in this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the wages of his sin, of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, all his entrails gushed out. That's gross. <laughs> Apparently, it, some have said that he had a failed suicide attempt, that he went to hang himself, but the limb broke, and he fell and you know, splattered his guts all over the ground, is basically what's being said here. And it came, became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that field is called in their language, in their own language, Akeldama, that is a field of blood. And we know how the story went, the 30 pieces of silver that Judas got, he went to turn it back in. The priest said, what are we going to do? We don't want this blood money. And so he left it there, he threw it at their feet, and he ran off and, and hanged himself. And the priest said, we don't want this money. So they went and bought the field where Judas went. And that's the story, that's how this field became the the potter's field or the, the um, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. That's uh, quoted from Psalm 69. And uh, also from Psalm 109, let another take his office. And actually, this is really quite a fascinating uh, look at, at the prophecies pertaining to... Um, to Judas. And in Psalm 109, in uh, verse, uh, around verse 4, in return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Imagine Jesus saying this now, even though David wrote it, here you're seeing this uh, as Jesus is living it in a sense. In verse 5 of Psalm 109, thus they have rewarded me evil for good, hatred for my love. Set a wicked man over him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. That's Judas. When he is judged, let him be found guilty. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. So this is what Peter is looking at and saying, guys, we've got to do something here. This is obviously talking about Judas. So let another take his office. We've got to find a replacement for him. Therefore, of these men who have, and this is the, the requirements of the one who would replace Judas. Number one, he says, he had to accompany us all at the time that the Lord went in and out among us. In other words, from the very beginning, when we were called to be his followers and apostles, there were, remember, there were the, there were the 12, and then there were the 70. So probably these apostles that they're going to select from were a part of the 70. They were that far back with, with the ministry of Jesus. In verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's the requirement to be an apostle. I know there are a lot of folks today that want to be apostles today. They call themselves apostles. Pretty tough one here to... Uh, be, they have a requirement like that. But nonetheless, that is the requirement for being an apostle, according to Peter. They proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice. So the first guy's a bit confused. He's not sure what his name is. The other is Matthias. And they prayed. And seeking the Lord's will, they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. Did you see that? He said this prophecy had to be fulfilled. But we've said this before, that doesn't mean that Judas had to be the one to fulfill it. He fell by his own transgression, his own choice. You know, we think, oh, he was destined to do it. He had no choice in the matter. Apparently he did, and he chose to sin, and that's why he has gone down into history as being Judas. <laughs> 
that he might go to his own place. Ooh, does that mean he's got a separate place? I don't know. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, of course, a lot of speculation that this shouldn't have been done. Uh, I like the way it was done. Whether it was right or wrong, I like how it was done in that they did it biblically, at least what they thought was biblically. If it was, if it was a mistake, and I want you to catch this, if it was a mistake, it was a mistake for a good reason. They thought they were doing the right thing. I don't believe that God spanks us when we think we're doing the right thing for a good reason, and they thought it was biblical. Whether it was or whether it wasn't, we don't know. You say, well, we never hear anything of Matthias after this, and that's true, we don't. But neither do we hear of Thomas, neither do we hear of of, uh, Bartholomew, we don't hear of any of them. In fact, the book of Acts follows Peter, John, we hear about uh, one of the James, uh, and, and then Paul, that's the only other one we hear about. And so it's not fair to say that these guys never amounted to much because chances are both of them went on to be great servants of the Lord. We just didn't hear about them. So uh, both Matthias and uh, Joe Barb, whatever you want to call them, went on to do some great works for the Lord as well. Now, I want to sneak into chapter 2. We're not going to do chapter 2. I just want to do something that was on my heart to do today in the first couple of verses. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And that place was no doubt the upper room, probably in the place known as Solomon's Porch. Solomon's Porch. Solomon's Porch is something that you find in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. In fact, let me read it to you very quickly. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Something very significant happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 in that place. In verse 1, when Solomon had finished praying, this is right after they had completed the construction of the temple. Solomon prayed. Notice, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now the word temple here in Hebrew means the house. That was the reference to God's house, the temple of the Lord. They called it the house. So the the glory of the Lord filled the house, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord that had filled the house, the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, Holy smokes. Well, I didn't, I just put that part in. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12 Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, he says, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer that has been made in this place. Now, today there is no temple. The place that he's talking about is your life. Now, let's read Acts chapter 2, this first couple of verses. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, all, it, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
Now, I think this is extremely significant when you look at what this is really talking about. And I've done something to give you a bit of a visual aid. I was walking in Israel this last trip, and I, and I saw these things everywhere. Those of you who were with me, remember seeing these everywhere. These are just little lanterns made of clay, simple clay pots, if you will. You take this little clay pot, and, and I'll, as I said, I, I'm going to do this whole thing visual aid. Like, you know, this is weird. I don't do this sort of thing. This is just things that weird people do who really can't teach well. But I'm just telling you this because this is something I want to do. This is simple olive oil. That's all that is. Too much olive oil, but that's what that is. It's olive oil. Now, you take the olive oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and you fill the olive oil, and you put the put this into the oil, the wick. The wick is what? Your life, right? I've always talked about that. I've always talked about the wick and how we always want to have our wick burning for Christ and our life burning for Christ. I think that this is significant because as you light it, it lights nicely. But it burns not the wick, it burns the oil. So here is the perfect partnership between the Holy Spirit and the human being. In that, we're the clay pot. Inside is the Spirit of God. Your ministry, your life is the wick. And the light is Christ. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. This is what he was talking about right here. He was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 5 said, be being filled. Listen, this is going to burn down. It's, it's, the wick's not going to burn. The oil's going to burn. And when that happens, you have to be filled again. You just keep filling yourself with the Spirit of God. And as you fill yourself with the Spirit of God, well, you actually make an impact on people. When you make an impact on people, you actually get to light another life. Oh, that's burning. That's not good. <laughs> well, sometimes ministry gets messy. Yeah. Do you get it? Yeah. And this is how the Christian life is supposed to be. No, this is how the Christian church is supposed to be. We just sit in our neighborhoods as light. That's what we do. We don't have to tell people what they're doing wrong. We've just turned on the light. They'll see it for themselves. They'll get it. They'll understand that, oh my gosh, this is what I was talking about Sunday, about being the, being the witness, being, raising the level of uh, the, the consciousness, the awareness of the world that they're living not in the way that God wants them to live, but, but they can see that, that there's a better way. We show them this as we let the light shine in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is talking, I'm sorry, that's what Luke is talking about here when he records this wonder of the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus said, wait, you can't do anything until you've been filled with my Spirit. The light won't shine brightly. Even if it did, drain the oil from this. You know what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen if you drain the oil? One of two things is going to happen, or both. Ultimately, either the light will go out or the wick will burn out. It will go to its end, and then it's over. Have you ever heard that saying for ministers? Burn out. It happens when you're operating in your own power rather than in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the perfect pairing between the work of God in a human's life. This is how it's supposed to be done. The power of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have that, get it. Get the power of God's Spirit in your life and you will burn forever. Amen? Amen. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that you have given us this promise of the power of your Holy Spirit. And I ask that you will fill us tonight, every one of us. And if you have not been filled, this is an opportunity right here, right now. Jesus, just tell the Lord, Jesus, I don't understand it. I just want your power. You talked about it. You promised it to anyone who will. I'm a clay pot. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and let my wick burn the light of Jesus Christ.
Tell him that. Make it a prayer of your heart. Ask him to fill you now. Jesus, fill me. Holy Spirit, come into my life. More and more and more of you, Lord. I will burn brightly for you, and I want to always be bright so that people will see Jesus. The wick gets no attention. It's Jesus that people will see in my life. This little clay pot. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.